Okay, it's 525, so let's get started. Um, I put a picture on my note right here. So can anyone guess as to what it is, what it's representing? <laughs> no, it's not grades. Your long program. Uh, my, not my long program, no. It was, it was actually a program that took like two seconds, so. Uh, yeah, I suppose. No, it has nothing, well, nothing. it has a little bit to do with this class. Participation. Not participation. It's something to do with that very last announcement. So I've been looking at that uh, extra credit question uh, about the complexity of generating that one string. And it was actually it turns out to be very interesting. So I was kind of bored before class, and I wrote a program. And I can actually get really high uh, complexity values uh, in terms of n. So if you really want to see something really cool, try to work on that question and see what else you can come up with with that. So it's very cool. So I just wanted to share. Yeah. Uh, three. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, these aren't optimal uh, values for sure. I just generated uh, a bunch of values just to see what would happen. Okay. Uh, any questions about problem set two that's due tomorrow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I can show that reversal is just regular, but as the w itself, um, is it just a string? Str strings are not regular or not regular. Languages are regular or not. So you could say that this language is pick every palindrome in the language and just take out the second half, right? Because that's just the w part of the palindrome. So the idea is, could you guess, guess, the second half of the string? Uh, yeah. And, and, and it had to have been a palindrome at the start. Oh, no, no, a palindrome entirely through. So use guessing to help you here. That's the hardest one of those seven parts. So. So if you don't happen to not get that one, it's not a whole bunch of points missed. Probably like one or two. Other questions about problem set two? OK. Problem set three, any questions? And when is that due? Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. Any questions about problem set three? Who hasn't started it? Should you have started it? Yes. But any questions about problem set three? Any other questions before we move on? Otherwise, when's your second midterm? Wednesday. 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 Good. And format's exactly the same, but I'll talk more about that on Monday. All right. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. Real quick, before we get into the big thing, can you do another uh, for the CFLs? Okay. So I have to think of a good language. So I'll, how about I solve the one that I put on Piazza, the powers of two length strings one. Okay, so let's let L be this language. So powers of two number of zeros, OK? And if I, if I show that this language is not context-free, what, what else can you conclude? It's not regular. Why? Yeah. Every regular language is context-free. All right, so if I want to show that this is not context-free, what do I need to do first? Assume it is context-free. Then what can I assume from that? There exists a pumping constant P for L. Okay. Well, now what? 
string. Pick a string, okay. Any old string or what what string? How about this string? No, why not that string? It, it may or may not have at least uh, uh, P characters. How about uh, that string? Has P characters. Well, well, it is long enough. I don't know if it's a power of two or not. It may or may not be. So we got to do both. To the P. That's a perfectly valid string. As long as I pick something uh, that's in the language and long enough. Well, it's certainly in the language. That's no problem. But is it long enough? Well, is 2 to the P bigger than P for all P at least 0? Well, check the cases. 0, 1 is bigger than 0, fine. 2 is bigger than 1, fine. And then it just doubles from there on. And so therefore that's true. So it is long enough. Now what do I need to do? I, I need to look at one decomposition or all decompositions? All of, all of them, okay. Well, what do I know that the decompositions look like? All zeros. Yeah, they're all zeros. That, that's no issue here. So, well, if they're all zeros, then all I need to think about is how many zeros am I going to add to the string or take away from the string by pumping up or down, depending on what I do. So let's... Suppose vy is 0 to the a. What do I know about a here? Greater than or equal to? Zero. Well, it's at least 0, but... Uh, no, uh, yeah. What is a here? It's at least... I'm holding it up. 1. How do we know it's at least 1? Because the second part of the pumping lemma for CFL says VY's length is at least 1. It's not empty. So that'll be helpful for us here. Well, how about let's pump up? Let's see what happens. So consider pumping up once to squared instead of just V and Y. Well, what is this string at the very end? I started off with how many zeros? To the P of them. And how many did I just add by pumping up once? Not 2A. How many V's and Y's did I just put in? More. One more. So how many characters did I just add? I added VY to the string. How many zeros did I just add? Oh, but precisely how many? A of them. Thank you. It's just counting. So I'm adding V and Y to the string. I just added A zeros to the string. So what is the only way that that string could be still in the language? Yeah, so no, uh, not necessarily. Because it could be some other power of 2. So... This implies that 2 to the p plus a is a power of 2, right? That's the only possible way. Well, what are the, what's the closest power of 2? The 2 to the p. Could it be equal to 2 to the p? No, it's not 2 to the p because why? A is at least 1. Well, could it be 2 to the p plus 1? Maybe. I don't know. But let's see. What is the largest that 2, plus, sorry, 2 to the p plus a could possibly ever be? What is the largest? p. So this is at most 2 to the p plus p. Because it can't be larger than that. Well, could
could this be equal to 2 to the p plus 1? No. And so this would imply if I subtract 2 to the p from both sides, I would have that this implies that p is equal to 2 to the p. Is that ever true? So never true. Could it be equal to like 2 to the p plus 2, possibly? No. no. Why? Yeah, it's already smaller. So we can, oops, not eraser. We can see that p is strictly less than 2 to the p for all p. Therefore, 2 to the p is strictly less than 2 to the p plus a, whatever the length string we just got, which is strictly less than 2 to the p plus 1. And since, like with squares before, when we did regular for that, uh, non-regular for that before, it's strictly between consecutive powers of 2. So can it be equal to a power of 2? No. Because it's between consecutive powers of 2 and not equal to either. So 2 to the p plus a is not a power of 2. And then, therefore, what can I conclude? Yeah, so first off, I can say that that string is not in the language. And then that tells me what? Yeah, L is not a CFL. OK? So all we did was just pump up once. And then we looked at what is the lowest, oh, sorry, what is the smallest length that that string, resulting string could be, and what is the largest, and saw it was between consecutive powers of two, just like with perfect squares before. Okay, yeah? Would pumping down and giving the same result? I believe so, yeah. Because um, you could be taking p characters out, but now you just gotta wonder if p could ever be, um, if 2 to the p minus p is ever equal to 2 to the p minus 1. And so that would imply that p is equal to 2 to the p minus 1. And so there's a problem there in that it could be if p uh, happens to be exactly 1. So now what you do is at the beginning, you in, instead of saying exist a p for l, you say that let the pumping constant I'm choosing be uh, uh, maximum of whatever was given to me and two. So, so you, or, or just pick any value that's either at least p or at least two. So therefore you guarantee that you don't ever have equality there. But yeah, pumping down to work there if you have that extra condition. Other questions? Okay, so that was a good example. So what did we end up finishing talking about last time? Pumping lemma for CFLs, but right before that, what did we discover? Well, a non-closure for a complement or whatever, but before we even did the pumping lemma, what did we even, what did we finish out, uh, finish up showing? The PDAs and CFGs are? Equivalent, you can convert back and forth. So I kind of want to take uh, a little step back as to what we've seen so far. So we first talked about regular languages. So this is the view of the world as we know it so far. So that has some circle. And we have like things like zero star, empty set. Should draw my empty sets better. Uh, and many, many other languages. But as we saw, there are some languages that are not regular. And what did we first call those or see some non-regular languages to be? Well, they're non-regular, but what was a classification for some of them that we've seen? Uh, Context-free. That was one of them. And one of the examples was 0 to the n, 1 to the n. 
So we have languages out here like 0zn, 1zn. And we were able to discover through a generalization of regular grammars that we can recognize languages like this one with context-free grammars or PDAs. And we called those the context-free languages. And it encompasses the regular languages because we saw that you can convert in every regular grammar already is a context-free grammar. So every regular language is context-free. But then what did we see? It, yeah, we, we found some languages that are not context-free either. And what was uh, our prototypical example? Zero to the, well, well, two to the n was one of them. So, yeah, that's a good, fine example. We actually just proved that one. But what was another one we saw? Yeah, zero to the n, one to the n, two to the n. And I don't know about you, but it seems a little bit frustrating that even with all that machinery of stacks and all these non deterministic transitions and whatnot, that we can't even recognize whether an input has the same number of zeros, ones, and twos in it. Th that seems kind of ridiculous, right? So, and you think, well, I can write a simple Python program in five minutes to, or hopefully less than an hour, a simple Python program that can recognize has the same number of zeros, ones, and twos. I can just set up a counter and then just go all the way through the input and just keep a track as to uh, how many of each I saw. And at the end, I just compare the three numbers. And if they're all equal, I say yes. If they're not equal, I say no. So even if I, if I have a counter, I can already recognize more languages. But it seems like we need a generalization of PDAs, or actually the context-free languages in general, to even recognize languages like these. And maybe we want to have a machine model or something like it that can recognize the same types of problems that I'm interested in or we're all interested in in terms of my computer can actually uh, I can actually write a program to have my computer recognize this language or compute some function along these lines so we're gonna finally close this loop and I'm not gonna name these yet but we're gonna actually start working on this for pretty much the rest of the semester and then get into some cool other things. So this is how the rest of the class is going to go. We're going to talk about something called a Turing machine for roughly a week and a half or so, which is a machine model that can do exactly what our computers can do. And it'll turn out that that's the fundamental limit of what computers are actually able to compute. And then we'll actually see there are problems that Turing machines can't uh, recognize or decide. And then after that, we'll start to think, well, OK, we have languages that are undecidable or are decidable. What about ones that we can actually do in a reasonable amount of time or a reasonable amount of resources? And that'll conclude the class. All right. Not yet, but eventually it'll conclude the class. All right, so if we want to recognize 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, for example, Well, an algorithm I just outlined, which is just uh, count the number of zeros, ones, and twos in the string in order, and then just compare the numbers at the end. Well, if I have an input like 0, one, zero to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, what would be an even less intuitive way, well, not less intuitive, but uh, uh, requires less thought than actually having this counter go all the way through the input? It, that's an idea. So I would have a two stacks, one that counts the number, keeps the zeros on one stack, keeps the ones in the second. And when I start seeing twos, I pop off of both stacks simultaneously. So that's like the PDA that we saw for zero to the n, one to the n, two, uh, zero to the n, one to the n. But I want to make it even simpler. I want to have something already like a single stack, but I want to be able to modify the input in some way. Uh, not modify the input, but modify what's on the actual 
uh, what's on that particular structure. So maybe what we can do is instead of like a stack where you can read or write or pop or push onto a single element on the top, maybe let's generalize that by allowing you to not only do that, but able to go through the rest of what's on this stack and then modify the contents along the way there. Okay, so that seems like a, a suitable generalization. So let's say that we have our input zero, uh, some particular input. And so let's say that this is the starting place. And let's just say, for example, that I provide the input on this particular structure. Well, how can I check whether the input really is something of the form zero to the n, one to the n, two to the n here? if I'm allowed to modify and go back and forth across the input. Well, maybe, oh, suggestion? Well, the input's not provided that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that seems like a good idea. I don't know how many zeros, ones, and twos there are. Well, maybe what I do is, if I see a zero, I overwrite that zero with an X or some character. And then, since it's of the form zero to the N, one to the, two, one to the N, two to the N, hopefully, if I mark off a, one, a zero at the beginning, what should I do with the other two parts? Mark off a one and mark off a two. So what I do is I'm going to scan right until I see a one, and then I'm going to cross that guy out, then go keep going until I see a two, and then I'm going to cross him out. And then what I do, once I uh, cross off that single two, what, do I, what should I do? Yeah, go back and try again. So I'm just going to keep going back here. So I'm going to be pointed now at this now second zero. Then scan right, cross off a one, cross off the second two. Then I'm going to go back, zero, cross off a one, cross off a two. And if it's of the form 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, what should I see at the very end? All x's. Well, if there is an extra 0 or, or as at any extra character, then when I try to match the 0 or whatever character with any other character, then I'm going to run into a problem. Okay? So this actually can recognize 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n pretty easily. So... These things are called Turing machines. So I'm going to redraw uh, what we just saw. So, but I'm going to have the, each of the cells be a single care. Sorry. This particular structure is going to have single cells in which um, there lives a single character. So just like a stack, but now I'm just going to reorient it so it's horizontal. So this particular data structure is called a tape. Because now what you're able to do is you're able to go back and forth across the now tape, as well as mark off uh, particular cells with some other value, or any value really. And so when we're looking at a particular cell, we indicate that by a arrow that comes from below. And this thing is called a tape head. OK. So the idea here is that the tape head is going to be pointed at, oops, the tape head's going to point at a single cell of this uh, tape. And it's going to examine the contents on this tape and decide whether or not to move left or right, and uh, as well as to change that particular cell to whatever value. Either keep it the same or change it to some other value. I'll define it formally in a second. All right. So how it executes a transition is examine current state. So there is a, machi a machine on the back end. 
uh, current tape symbol, so the thing that it's currently looking at, and then determine what is the next state symbol to write in that cell and uh, whether to move left or right. So I'm going to ask a question that I've asked several times before. Are computers deterministic or non-deterministic? Determinist. Deterministic. Well, if I want this model of computation to resemble my computer, what should this machine be, deterministic or not? Deterministic. deterministic. So we want this, this uh, Turing machine to be deterministic. So here what we want is that, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. So I'll tell you an interesting story. Does anyone know what the term, where the term computer comes from? Like the original meaning. Where actually there were people that were computers in Exactly. Way back in the day, they had people who had a job title called computer. And what they did is they, I, I don't have an example, but they, they had a huge stack of paper right next to them that had a bunch of numbers written on it. And what they do is they examine what's on that current page, and then they make a certain mark on that page. And then depending on what happens, either they go to the next sheet, so they take one off and put it face down on the next, uh, right next to them on the other pile, or they go backward one sheet. So this is actually a generalization of that. So what, uh, yeah, it's just a generalization by saying there's a single symbol on the page, and then they figure out what the next page is, and then what to write on that current page. Okay, so a little bit of interesting history though. Everyone good? Um, yeah. So the curve line is what it's doing. Yeah. Excuse my atrocious handwriting. Or don't excuse it, but <laughs> any other questions? So let's formally define this thing. So a Turing machine is a something tuple. So this one's going to be the longest of, of all the ones we've seen. So now we got to think a little bit more deeply as to what Turing machines should be able to do. Well, when we talked about DFAs or even PDAs, do they ever modify their input? No. Then no. and, and they never go back across their input either, which is something to worry about here. Well, since they're modify could be potentially modifying the original input, how do I know when to accept? Well, the definition of acceptance was we read through the entire input and then we ended in the final state at the same time. What about here? Because we're modifying the input. Well, I may not. I may need more than what's provided on the input. But like, like in the computer person example, uh, they may need an extra sheet of paper. So we're going to have some notion of requiring more space than the input. So how do I know when to accept? Well, I could have a notion of a final state, uh, which we will do, but. Uh, yeah, so we need to think of this a little bit more. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, designate a special state to be what is called the accept state. But we also need one for when we don't accept the input because of the same reasoning. We don't know, since we're modifying the input, when to stop. If we end in the final state, then that's perfectly fine for a, fi uh, 
saying that the input should be accepted, but how do we know when the input's not accepted? We need a special state for that too. So why not just have the possibility of a single final state or what is called the accept state or a single reject state? Because if I have multiple accept states, then I might as well just put them all into one. Okay. Any questions so far? Though? Yes. I am aware I answered my own question. <laughs> All right. Well, since this model has states and is a generalization of PDAs or DFAs, but in a deterministic way, we need states and we need input as well. So Q, as always, is a finite set of states. Sigma is a finite input alphabet. Okay. So think about that scenario that I mentioned before a little bit more. What if I hit the wall at the end of the input and then I say, okay, now go to the next cell. What's on that next cell? I don't know. Well, the input wasn't there. So we need a special signifier as to say, this is a cell that currently has nothing on it. So we're going to denote a special character called a blank character. So uh, I'm going to do it down here. And so how is this blank character going to come into being? Well, the tape, I'm going to say to be an infinite tape. So this tape is one way infinite. It has a left side and it infinitely extends to the right side. So the input is going to be presented on left adjusted on the tape. And then an infinite series of blanks follows after that. If this notion of infinite tape is going to cause a problem, we're going to deal with it in a bit. But the tape is going to be is one way infinite. The input is left adjusted on the tape at the very start, and the whole rest of the tape afterward is this special character called a blank character. So, what about this blank character? Should I I'll be allowed to put that in the input alphabet? No, and what would be a good reason as to why I shouldn't put it in the input alphabet? Well, I, sh I should be able to operate on it in the sense that if I go too far, then I know I've hit the, at the end of the input, and so I should be able to come back. Because if it's there and you do something, you can still make another thing to do it right. Don't. That, that's partially right. So the idea, the problem that may arise is what if I provided an input that looks like a Googleplex number of blanks and then the uh, non-blank input. If I allowed that, that particular character in the input alphabet, how would I know that there's a non-blank portion after that blank series? So it, uh, I wouldn't know where the input is. And another thing that might cause a problem is suppose that the tape that's given to me is entirely blank characters. And I say to my friend who provided that to me, oh, uh, you provided me a tape that has entirely blank characters. And he says, no, I gave you five characters and then blanks. Because if I allow blank character in the uh, input alphabet, then that might cause ambiguity as to what the input actually is. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to need another alphabet to be able to say, okay, this is a blank character, or, or allow you to put a blank character on the tape. So we're going to have a third piece, which is the uh, finite tape alphabet. 
And what we're going to say is that the blank character is in the tape alphabet and is not in the input alphabet. Okay. What it, what should be the notion between those two alphabets? Not quite disjoint. Actually, the opposite. <laughs> well, where's the input provided? On the tape. So, what should be the relation between these two alphabets? Uh, well, the problem might be that I may allow you to put other characters on the tape as well, other than the blank character. So well, like with the stack with the PDA, I can allow you to put some other characters as well as the input characters if I wanted to. So I think what we should have is that the input alphabet is a subset of the tape alphabet, for sure, at least because I want to be able to put the input on the tape. So we're going to have the input alphabet be a now strict subset of the tape alphabet. Any questions? All right, so I'm going to skip a piece for now. I need a start state. Just like before. And then, like we talked about before, we need a special uh, accept state to denote that we actually should accept the input at this point. And then another state that should represent we should reject the input at this point. So I'm going to call them Q accept and Q reject. So Q accept is the accept state. And Q reject is the reject state. What should the relation be between Q accept and Q reject? They, they can't be the same. Why? Because it would be ambiguous as to whether I should accept the input or not. So I should allow, uh, not allow, enforce that Q accept is not Q reject. All right. What's the thing that I am forgetting here? Yeah, I need transitions, uh, just like the other two models. So I'm going to have the transition function be, oh, let's see. So I'm going to define it way down here. So we got to define delta. And whatever it is, it better be a total function because I want this thing to be deterministic. I want for any state that I'm in and any input symbol that I see, there must be exactly one transition to do. So I better have a total function here. Well. How do I denote I'm looking at my current state and looking at the current symbol that I'm reading on the tape? Well, current state is from? Q. Uh, current tape symbol is from? Gamma. So those are the things we need to look at. And then once I figure out what those two are, what are the things that I will be able to determine at the, after that? Yeah, that's the third piece. But yeah, so left to right, well, next state, and what else? The, the character to write on the tape. Yeah, because like that computer example, uh, I can write on that particular piece of paper with a special other character. Or with the example we have here, we crossed out on the actual tape. So I need to be able to write down next state, the symbol to write on the tape, and whether to move left or right. So next state should be from Q. The character to write should be from gamma. And now I'll do this last one. 
I need to be able to choose left or right, and we're going to denote that by L and R for left and right. So I'm not going to allow you to stay at the same cell. I'm forcing you to move left to right. Okay? And so could there be a problem here with the transitions? What if I'm at the very beginning and the first transition says move left? Because I'm left adjusted at the beginning of the input. So there are two scenarios to fix uh, that could happen here. They won't actually be that important, but it's important. It's just uh, important to actually be thinking about this sort of thing. So the two scenarios we'll be seeing are uh, bouncing, a very technical term, on the left end of tape. So the idea here is that, I think this is the way Sipser does it, is you're in the left uh, most cell of the tape, you say left, you're just gonna hit the left hand end of the tape and end right where you started from, in that same cell. Another way of looking at this is that the computation stops and rejects. Because it's, it's sort of analogous to how the PDA, if it has an empty stack and you try to empty, if you try to pop off the empty stack, well, the computation just terminates. Same thing here. So um, we're not going to really make a distinction between these two, but I believe Sipser does the bouncing one. And if it happens to be the case that we're in the leftmost cell, we write the same uh, character on that same cell and we say go left, well, am I going to be doing that same process over and over? Yeah, I will be because the Turing machine is deterministic. So, I, for example, if I see an A on that cell, I say move left, and I wrote an A on that cell. I'm going to do the same thing forever and ever. Well, if we follow this model of computation where uh, you go back to the same cell. So it may be possible for Turing machines to run forever. But DFAs didn't have that problem. And it actually turns out PDAs also don't have that problem if you work a little bit on it. But DFAs certainly don't have that problem. But Turing machines do because you can modify the input and go back. Yeah. So I'm confused as to how sigma fits into this just because it, it, it hardly ever does. Okay. Yeah. It, it's just to denote what could appear on the input and um, the tape alphabet is the one we almost exclusively work yeah, with. Yeah, it looks like the yeah. sigma is exactly just yeah. goes on. Well, they, they have to be different because the blank characters, oh, yeah. yeah. But um, you can make them, other than that character, the same. Okay. Yeah. But it has to be a subset because it has to be provided on the input. Other questions? Okay. So we need to think about this transition function just a little bit more. Well, if I entered that Q accept state or that Q reject state, should I be able to do a transition afterward? No, because it, if I enter one of those states, I've made a, a determination as to what I should do with that input. So technically, this uh, transition function should be instead Q prime, where it is Q without Q accept, Q reject. And I actually wrote to Michael Sipser about that, and, and he said that he kept it to say that every single state has a transition, including Q accept and Q reject, because that would make it more intuitive. But this is actually how it should be defined that it has every state except Q re except and Q reject. Okay? Okay. So, let's make a Turing machine. So, we outlined an idea of how to do 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, 
Well, the other non-context-free example that we showed today, actually, is powers of two number of zeros. Well, we showed it wasn't context-free, but it may be nice to have a Turing machine do that. So that's what we're going to do here. Okay. So let's say that, um, let's just outline an idea and then we'll actually make a state diagram. So if I have a bunch of zeros here, and my task or our task is to figure out whether the number of zeros presented to me is a power of two or not. So, what, what might be a good idea to try here? Well, I'm going to offer a suggestion. Suppose what I do is I cross off every other zero. And I continue all the way through, and maybe I cross off that guy. How many zeros are left now? Half as many. Well, how do I get half of the number of zeros remaining now? Do the same thing, but on the zeros. So what I should do is cross off that zero. Should I mark off the next zero? No, no I should skip over that guy. Okay, and then I'm going to come back and find the first zero and mark it off. Well, suppose I have the entire input full of x's now. And now I'm going to go left, 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 left. What am I going to hit? I'm going to hit the left hand end of the tape. Because if I see a bunch of x's and I just say, keep going left until you find a zero to cross off, I'm going to hit the left hand end of the tape if I have no zeros left on the tape. So. What, I, what we need to do first is put some other character at the beginning to, deter, to let us know, okay, you're right now at the left-hand end of the tape. Any suggestion for a character? No. Dollar sign or what's another one that we already have? Blank. We can certainly do blanks too. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to mark the first character with a blank right at the beginning, and then we're going to cross off every other zero that we see, and then zoom back left until I see a blank. And once I see the blank, what should I see the whole rest of the way? X's. Until I hit a blank. So that's what we're going to do. So I, I'm not going to give names to the states because there's going to be quite a few. Actually, not that many. But so the first transition is what? It says, see a, if I see a zero right now, what should I do with it? The very first zero, though. Blank it out, and then which direction should I move? Move to the right. So the way we're going to denote this is the character that we see first then an arrow, then the character to write, which in this case is a blank, and then comma, and then now either left or right, depending on what direction we want to move. So move right. And that goes to some state. Okay. Well, now what's our task? Once we saw that first blank, what are we going to do the first time through. Cross off every other zero. Am I going to start with the first zero here? But we could, or not. It doesn't actually matter here. So we're going to mark the first zero first, and then skip every other zero. So we're going to go to another state where we're going to, every time we see a zero, I'm going to mark it off with an X and move right. And that's going to go to some state. So 
Now what we need to do is skip over uh, a zero and then mark the next zero. And since, so since we're doing this in a two-step process, I need another state down. Why are you doing this transfer? Because I want to start the process of marking every other zero. Okay. And so I'm doing this at the very first zero that I see. Right, so we replace the first one with a blank. So yeah. The second one, we would cross that one out? Yes. It actually won't matter because I'm crossing off every other one anyway. Okay. So I, I'm gonna eventually, even if I end up off sync by one, it's still gonna find the zero when it comes back and cross it off anyway. Okay? Yeah. So the first yeah, it represents the zero. Yeah. Well, we should actually make a yeah, go ahead. Isn't that Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it actually won't matter because when I come back to find a zero, I'm still going to find it anyway. Yeah, so, so it actually won't matter, but I need to start somewhere. And we need this uh, other state right here because, um, yeah, so th there are multiple ways of doing this. Uh, I'm just doing a particular one. Yeah, other questions? All right. So once we go to this state right here, this uh, one on the right, we need to mark off every other uh, zero. So what we need to do is, once we see a zero, take one transition and don't change the contents of the tape or write the exact same contents on the tape and then come back crossing off that zero. So how we're gonna do this we're going to come down here. We're going to see a zero, write a zero, and move right. Then come back, zero, cross it out. And then just repeat that over and over and over. Yeah? Is the interchange? No, because um, even if n is zero, that's one zero. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. If I'm in this state right here, that second state, and the input provided was n equals zero, which is exactly one zero, if I mark that first blank off with, uh, uh, yeah, that first zero with a blank, and I move right, what should I see? A blank. So if I'm in that state right there, if I see a blank, where should I go? Go to Q accept. So, and, now I need to make a choice as to what I'm going to write on the tape and which direction to move. It actually won't matter as long as I move right. If I move left, then that might cause an issue because I may be at the left-hand end of the tape. So there's no problem moving right. Here. So I'm going to go to Q. So I'm going to call, uh, name this state because it has an important purpose. Okay, so let's see. Well, I'm gonna be doing this cross off every other zero thing over and over, but so I'm gonna be crossing off a zero and coming back to this state at the top. How do I know that I'm done doing this cross off every other thing? I hit a blank. And that, so once I see that blank, what is my next task? Yeah, move left, and how far should I move left? To, to the only other blank that I'll see along the way, which is at the very beginning. So I'm going to come out over here. And so I'm going to make a little bit of a simplification to some of these transitions. If we read and write the same symbol, we uh, abbreviate it with the character that we read and write, and then arrow left, or the direction, yeah. Can we use a blank one on both of the ends of it? Because it could technically come out anywhere. What do you mean on both ends? So like on each of those states, the top state and the bottom state. Because I mean, it's 
Well, I'm crossing off every other zero. So once I see a zero, I better see another zero to cross off. Okay, so it doesn't, well, I'm just saying, what if you, you know, you see a zero and you're down in that bottom state and then you see the blank transition? Would you need to have another blank transition? Well, that would correspond to an odd number. Yeah, so how would Yeah, so it can't be a power of two. But wouldn't, isn't it going to be like that you don't have to have that? We'll deal with that in a second. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do right here. Yeah. I think you've been denoting where, uh, where we're looking at the arrows. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that has nothing to do with that. Okay, I just to sure. Yeah, that, that's just so I don't have to say a third state on yeah, the okay. top right. Other questions? All right, so once we see this blank on the far right side, or to you guys, the far right side, now we need to scroll uh, left, or scan left as it's called. Well, what am I going to see along the way before I hit the blank symbol? Zero or a X. So I'm going to stay in this state. And if I see a zero, I move left. If I see an X, I move left. I, I want to make this, I, I could, but uh, I want to make it so that the, the part where it does the crossing only moves right. And the part that moves left it doesn't do any modification in case that, uh, yeah, it's just for correctness reasons. I could, though, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a simplification that just says we read and write the same symbol. So, yeah. So why are we reading and writing if we're going left and thought we just wanted to read and not yeah. thought we were trying to get to the right? Correct. So the way that Turing machines work is that they always write some symbol. It, it, it always writes a symbol. It so may be... write a zero and then an exit again, even going left? Yeah, so even if it, as it's going left, if it sees a zero, it's still writing a zero on the tape, but it, uh, so I could write the same symbol, but it's always writing a symbol. Okay. So always moves out of the current cell to the right or left. Yeah, it always writes in the cell that it was just reading. Yes. Other questions. So the one you you're referring to that transition. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter. So you said you see zero, you write a zero, you go to the right. Yes. Yeah. So I could abbreviate this by zero arrow right, because it's writing the same symbol. Yeah. For the ones that are different, I need to actually say what was actually written. Okay. Well, once I zoom past all these uh, zeros and x's, I should see a blank. And so I'm going to come back once I see that blank. And which direction should I move once I see that blank? Right. Move right. But once I come back, I'm going to um, potentially have some x's along the way, right? Should I change any of those x's? No. So what should I do if I, once I come back, I see X's? I should just go past all of those. So on these other states, I'm going to have transitions where I just go past all the X's because I don't care about the X's. All right? As well as these other two states. OK, so the ideas should be pretty clear. We mark a special character at the beginning. We could have picked dollar sign or whatever. And we initially marked it there. Then we're just going to zoom past uh, the input, marking every other zero off. And then go all the way back, mark every other zero off, go back. 
And if I marked everything off correctly, there should be only what after that blank? Well, the, well, there should be all X's, right? Until I see a blank. Do I handle that logic here? When, when I come back and I see a blank, if I see all X's and then I see a blank, do I accept at that point? Yep. So this loop right here, it goes past all of the X's and then if it sees a blank, then it accepts. And so, uh, yeah, so you can always move right because there will always be more tape to the right, but not necessarily to the left. So that's why I moved right. So let's see how this machine goes. So let's name these states. So I am going to name the states. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I was curious, and you're probably going to explain this now, mm -hmm. maybe I'll just like, be quiet. Um, but like, if I have four dealers, for example, and I'm replacing the first one with a blank, but there's three left, mm -hmm. so how is it going to know that you have, you have a, uh, a power of two zeros after it, if there's like three zeros after the one blank? It, it's not going to actually know. It's just going to execute the transitions. It, it doesn't actually know. So. I'll have three zeros left, so I'm going to mark the first and third, yeah. right? Then I'm going to go back, and then I'm going to hit the blank character at the beginning, then C and X, move right, mark off the zero on the... Yeah. That's the oh, that's right. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why that's... Yeah, let's actually carry through the computation because I think you raised a good point. So if I am in, if I see the input zero 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 in state Q zero, then it says mark off the first zero with a blank and move right. So now, so I'm gonna write this as I'm gonna put the state below the current cell that I'm reading. We'll have a better way of doing that in a second. So we'll have the three zeros left over. Then I'll be in Q1. And Q1 says, if you see a zero, write an X and move right. So I'll have blank X and go to Q2, zero, zero. No, that should be fine. It'll end up fine. Yeah. Uh, good point for bringing it up, though. So if you had a qu question. Well, I'm just so I'm just thinking about the logic right mm -hmm. out the machine. So the mm -hmm. machine's just going to do this thing. So it's up to us to come up with the logic to figure out. I mean, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, so the machine doesn't care about. It's not actually counting the number of zeros. Oh no, it just, no. It needs to. Okay. That's yeah. 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 It's totally blind. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's just. It's just. Uh, it's a completely dumb machine. It, it's just uh, reading and writing stuff on the tape and changing states, just like a DFA. Yeah, yeah. So let's carry through the computation a little more. So I'm in Q2 and I see a zero, what should I do? Write a zero and move right. So I'll have blank X zero and I'm in state Q3 reading a zero. Yeah, so now it says if I'm in Q3, I see a zero, I write an X and move right. So I'm going to move this up here for space. So I'll have blank X zero, and then it just said cross it out. But if I'm in Q2, what am I looking at here? Blank. So what I'm writing here are what are called configurations, and I'll define configurations uh, in a little bit. But uh, intuitively speaking, it's just the tape that you've seen. And if you need more tape, you put you append on whatever you need to see. So in this case, I need to see a blank, and so I append it on. Uh, it's kind of like a vector, yeah. All right, so if I'm in Q2 and I see a blank symbol, what do I do? It says move left and go to Q4. So I'll have blank 
x, 0, but now I'm looking at the x in Q4, and I didn't change that blank symbol. And then what does Q4 say to do? Right x, uh, move left, or right a 0 and move left. So it's just going to, if I do this one step at a time, it's going to move left one position to see the 0, then one position more to see the x, and then now it'll be at the blank symbol at the beginning. And it says, if I'm in Q4 and I see a blank, what do I do? Write a blank and move right. Good. So I'll have blank. Now I'm looking at the X in Q1. 0, X, blank. So if I'm in Q1 and I see an X, what do I do? Just zoom past those guys. So blank. This is getting pretty long. Uh, X, 0, Q1 x blank, and then now q1 says, oh, I see a 0 now, cross it out, and move right. So blank x x, and the third x is looking in q2. So I, I won't progress to the rest of the computation because it's getting long at this point. So q2 is just going to move right again, see the blank. Uh, it's going to go to Q4 and move left. Q4 is going to go all the way back to the blank at the beginning. Uh, Q4 is going to move right and go to Q1, so it's looking at that first X. Q1 is going to look at the X's and zoom past those, and eventually it'll see a blank. And at that point it goes to Q accept and therefore accepts. Is there something missing from this diagram? Q reject. Q reject. Why do you think I didn't draw Q reject? What about like all the transitions from Q3 on input blank? I said it had to be a total function. Q3 doesn't, for example, doesn't have a transition on blank. So where do you think that all those transitions go? Q, Q reject. So all unwritten transitions transitions go to Q reject. Any questions? Want... Yes, absolutely. Other... Uh, can you do that sort of thing on the test? Absolutely. Other questions? I think I went a little over time for a break. All right, let's take a five-minute break.